Hello and welcome to Cup of Cosmology, the place for all your questions about the universe. My name is Diana Hooper and I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently working at the Helsinki Institute of Physics over in the University of Helsinki in Helsinki, Finland. And I'm a theoretical, theoretical physicist specializing in cosmology. So that means that I study the universe, the contents of the universe, how things evolve, how things interact, all of the cool stuff happening inside the universe. It's a great topic. I love being a cosmologist. I love studying the universe. And I love chatting to everybody about all of the cool things I get paid to study and stuff that I don't study and just like, like reading up about. And I just realized I started this stream extremely hyper. So be breath, everybody. Let's get into this currently. Hello to anybody who's a new viewer. Welcome back to the regulars. It's great to have everybody here. I know I've been absent for the last three weeks. It's great to be back online. I've had a lot of stuff happening the last few weeks. It's been an eventful November, but I'm back now. If you haven't done so yet, please do like the video, subscribe, leave a comment, do all of the usual YouTube stuff. It really does boost engagement and it makes it a lot easier for other people to find my streams, which means then more people will get to ask me questions and I get more people to tell about all the joys and wonders of the universe. So please do all of the usual engagement things. I see we already have two of the regulars in here, David Howden, Scott, great to see you both. I know I've been away for a while. Great to see you both here on time. I know I'm late today. The reason I'm late is because I was setting up. I was actually on time for once. I, I have this thing where I'm very good at time management, except when it comes to these streams. And every Sunday, about 15 minutes before I'm set to go live, I find something that, that sucks me away. And suddenly it's five to eight, my time, and I suddenly need to, need to get into it. Um, but this time I was actually on time. I was setting up. 15 minutes early, and then I got an unexpected phone call. And it was a phone call, so I stayed on the call, and that's why I'm late here. So sorry that I'm late here, but I was in a phone call, and that's why I'm a few minutes late. I see some of you have already noticed my ugly Christmas jumper. I absolutely love this ugly Christmas jumper. It has T-Rexes on it, it's covered in T-Rexes, and it says Merry Xmas. And um, I absolutely love it, it is hideous. I am a big fan of hideous Christmas jumpers. I think everyone should have an ugly Christmas jumper. And what makes this one even nicer is that I got this in a secondhand clothes shop. I have no idea why somebody would give this away. It is objectively an awesome jumper. I have no idea why anyone would give this away, but I found this in a secondhand clothes shop, which means I got it cheap and I love it. And now that it's December, it is officially Christmas season. I put my Christmas tree up today. You might have noticed that instead of the usual lo-fi music, we had Christmas music while you were waiting for me to start. Restream added a new button that said Christmas music. So of course I had to click that button to see what would happen. It didn't sound overly Christmassy, but anyway. Uh, Prath, great to see you. And great to see all of the regulars tuning in here as well. You forgot stream is at 11.30. So I thought no stream today when I didn't get the ping at 10.30. I guess you've changed time zone. Or have I changed time zone? I, I have no idea anymore. There, there's been a few weeks absence and I know some people who do shift daylight saving time at different points. Technically, this is my regular schedule, which is 8 p.m. for me, 7 p.m. Central European time, um, 6 p.m. if you're in the UK, 1 p.m. if you're on the East Coast of the US, 10 a.m. if you're on the West Coast of the US. I don't know it in all the other time zones. But um, yeah, I, I don't know where what time it is for everybody, but this is technically my regular schedule, 8 p.m. on a Sunday evening, because it's the time that works best for me as well. And it seems to be the time that works well for quite a few of the regulars. And I saw the comment already, an interstellar nine minutes on Miller's planet is 422 days on Earth, indeed, but I was not nine minutes late on Miller's planet time, I was nine minutes late in Earth time. So fortunately, it's probably a few years somewhere else, but here at least you only had to wait like five or six minutes for me to come on, not several, several years, or several days even. So anyway, welcome back to Cup of Cosmology. I know I've been absent for quite a while. No, no DSC changes in India. I forgot that change happened at your end. Okay, yeah, that change happened at my end three, three weeks ago, or like the last weekend in October is when it usually happens. But to be fair, I haven't, I've only been online once since then, so it makes sense if, if um, you hadn't noticed that I changed time. Yes, yes, that was quite a long time ago already, but I've only been online once since then because there's been a lot happening in November. Uh, so yeah, welcome back on that note. I know I've been absent for a while. I was supposed to be online on the 12th, had some personal stuff going on that kept me away. The 19th, I was at a craft fair. So absolutely not, not online because I was 19th, 20th, whichever day that was, I was at a craft fair and it was super fun and exhausting. And I bought a bunch of stuff that I didn't need and a bunch of stuff that I did need. It was a really fun thing. I love craft fairs. And last Sunday, 
some of you might have noticed that there was a stream scheduled and it was advertised and I was set to go live and then the stream just disappeared with a message saying minor medical emergency stream is cancelled. If you didn't see that, don't worry. If you saw that and wondered what happened, short version is Finnish winter is extremely treacherous. And despite the fact that I love Finnish winter, the there was um, there was a layer of ice hiding under fresh snow and I walked outside and tripped on the ice and ended up at the emergency room. I am fine. Nothing to be worried about. Just um, just means that my right arm is a bit a bit stiff and a bit difficult to use, but nothing's broken. So uh, if you see me moving my hands less than usual today, it's because my right arm doesn't work properly. And that's why there was no stream last week, because I fell on the ice in a very comical manner. Like, she went flying. It was very funny in hindsight. But yes, that's why I wasn't online last week. Online today, but only moving one hand. The other hand is just sat here uselessly doing not much other than just, you know, emotional support. Okay. On that note, I have not really had time to prepare any topic because there's been a lot going on. Hey, James, great to see you. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot going on, so I haven't prepared a topic, which means today you get to ask me anything you want and you decide where we take this conversation. As always, this is an interactive stream. The idea here is that you people can ask me anything you want and based on what you ask, we'll decide what topics we talk about. So you really have complete control over where this stream goes. Obviously, I will lead it in some places like there's a high chance that I will give you all a chance to ask me about my favorite thing in the universe, which is, of course, my slides are slow, which is, of course, the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, um, yeah, this is this is always a topic that I will lead people to ask me about seven and a half minutes today, in case you're wondering how long that took. So um, any questions you have about physics, about cosmology, about academia, about what happened to my arm, about Finnish winter, basically anything you want. This is an ask me anything. The idea is that you can ask me literally anything you want. And I will do my best to try to answer these questions. But I can make no, um, no promises, no guarantees that I will have the answers or know the answers to everything. But I will do my best. Uh, I see someone saying gravity is dangerous. I agree. Gravity is indeed very dangerous. Gravity is a very dangerous thing. Unfortunately, it brings us all down. If anybody just got the Mavity reference, I appreciate it. Please keep this chat spoiler free for anyone who has not yet seen the latest Doctor Who episodes. Please keep the chat spoiler free. I know I just made an offhand reference there, but please let's keep this spoiler free in case anyone's seen the latest Doctor Who episode for those people who have not. Um, I think I heard that we discovered a sixth planet solar system. I a sixth planet solar system that does not ring any bells. There should be eight solar systems. Ah, a sixth planet solar system. Okay, not another planet in the solar system, but a solar system that has a stellar system, planetary system with six planets. Sounds right, to be fair. We've discovered about 3,500 exoplanets by now. So an exoplanet is any planet that is outside of the solar system in its own system. We've discovered three and a half thousand by now. It's pretty awesome. It's amazing that we've been able to do this, but by now it's reached the point where people find an exoplanet and we barely bet an eye. It's like, okay, well done. You found another one. Good for you. It's kind of like gravitational waves. It's become so commonplace and now we're just like, oh, there's another event. Cool. Well done. I mean, it's still amazing and discovering a planet or a system with six planets is a bit amazing. I had not heard that, but I'm not surprised. We're finding more solar system, more planets and stellar systems all the time. And it's very, very, very cool. Okay. Uh, I see the question, has the ocean frozen over yet? Not completely, but there are there are patches that are starting to freeze over. The bays are starting to get a bit frozen, but it's like only, only in quotation marks, minus 10. And we need it to be a bit colder for a few days, for like a week or two before the sea starts freezing over. So that's usually more in January, February when the sea freezes over here, which is still mind blowing to me. The sea should not freeze over. I grew up in the Mediterranean. The sea freezing over makes no sense to me. But apparently it's a thing that happens here in the Nordics. And it's amazing when it happens. Hasn't happened yet. But yeah, it is it is something that apparently happens. And it will happen in a couple months. And every time I see it, I, I freak out about it. But no frozen seas yet, just starting to get there. Okay, so I know there were two comments that I overlooked already. So I'll go back and look at those. <coughs> Let's see. Uh, I just saw the comment uh, from Scott of what was my emergency room bill. Um, so a lot of countries that are not the US has something known as universal health care, which means going to the emergency room was not an expensive thing. I am going to get a symbolic bill that is going to be less than 50 euros. Uh, that's going to come at some point over the next year. But yeah, I got I was in the emergency room for four and a half hours. I got an x-ray. I got seen by two doctors. 
and it's going to cost me less than 50 euros because we have universal health care, which is a thing that most countries should have and every country should have. Um, the US is a very different system and I'm very fortunate to live in a country that has good health care. So yeah, my emergency, I did not pay anything while I was at the emergency room, I will get a bill that's going to be less than 50 euros at some point in the next weeks. But yeah, that, that's an answer to your question of how much my how much I paid for my emergency bill. You don't say north of the Arctic Circle, do you? No 24 hour night for you? No. So I'm in Helsinki, which is a couple of hours south of the Arctic Circle. I'd have to go a few hours north to find that. So here we do get some daylight, not a lot. We get about, currently days are about five and a half hours long. So the sun is coming up around 9.30ish and it's going down around 3ish, 3, 3.30. 3 so days are less than six hours. By the end of this month or in a couple of weeks, they will be around four and a half hours. So we do get, we do get a, a lot of dark, but we do still get some sunlight here. So we don't we don't have the um, the polar night. You'd have to go a few hours further north. Actually, if you go up to the Lapland area, there's a place where you can cross the Arctic Circle, and there's like a line saying, "Oh, you've crossed the Arctic Circle." I've done that. It's fun. And now there are places where the sun has set in Finland and it will not rise again until mid-January. So there are places in Finland that have started the polar night where they're going to get, I think it's about 50, 55 days of complete darkness with no no lights coming up. So yeah, that the further north in Finland, there are already places in the, um, in the absolute darkness. And that sounds amazing. And at some point I am going to travel up there and spend a few days there during polar night because it just sounds so cool. Okay, so there was some some physics question scrolling back up. Question from from David Howden. Recently found an old BBC Kids Education program which, among teaching basic reading, found time to explain making a telescope. Then muse on: Is there a place where the universe ends? That is that is a cool thing. Not sure there is that much cosmology in modern kids TV. Yeah, I think it's very cool to to think about things like that. And the whole idea of building your own telescope. I think it's something that we are losing. Like honestly. It would, I would struggle to build my own telescope. I'd have to look up manuals right now. But I feel like it's a really fun activity to do if you have young kids or, you know, it, it, or even adult kids, you know, people who, who never grow up like, like me. Uh, it's just a really fun thing to do. You can get some basic supplies to get and build the basic telescope, and then you can actually see the observation power. And if, like, the, the Newtonian-style telescope with a couple of mirrors and, and the tube, they're relatively easy to build. And I think it's a really fun activity that you can do if you have anyone in your life kind of interested in, in space or even interested in doing stuff. Building a telescope is a great like weekend activity. And I think we should do more of that because apart from the thing that then you get to build something, you actually then get to use it to look at the night sky. So it's an amazing thing. And I think, you know, if you want a fun weekend activity to do with, with your family, figure out how to build a telescope, find the materials together. You could do this pretty cheaply. You can build a basic telescope pretty cheaply. So that's a great thing to do. And the question of is there an edge of the universe is a very interesting one. And the thing is, from our perspective, the universe is everything that exists. Therefore, there can be no edge because an edge would imply a separation between existence and non-existence. And non-existence isn't something that really makes sense. What it was it is what is it an edge to? So this whole idea of the edge of the universe is, is something that doesn't make sense given our understanding of cosmology. So it's a fun question to ask, of, is there an edge of the universe? And based on our understanding of the universe being everything in existence, there can be no boundaries or no edges to it. We can have an edge to the observable universe, which is how much of the observable universe is a patch of the universe that we can plausibly see if we had infinitely good technology. It's basically the part of the universe that has had time to send us information. So we know that speed, that light travels at a finite speed. It cannot travel faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. So this, this means that there are some things in the universe that have not had time to send us their light because the universe is only 14 billion years old. So things that are too far away have not had time to send us light. And this gives us a radius of what is known as the observable universe, which is kind of this sphere centered around us. And it's everything that has had time to send us information, everything that is within our causal horizon. So there is an edge to the observable universe. I should stop using that arm. There is an edge to the observable universe 
because there is a point that has not been able to send us light. Incidentally, the edge of the observable universe just happens to coincide with the cosmic microwave background radiation because this is the oldest light in the universe. So this is what is kind of at the edge of our causal horizon. Everything beyond that doesn't, well, beyond that, you could get signals from things like primordial Big Bang nucleosynthesis and gravitational waves. But the earliest light that we would see at the edge of the observable universe would be this one, the CMB, cosmic microwave background radiation, oldest light in the universe, 380,000 years after the end of inflation, when photons broke away from photons and electrons. Second CMB, you already had one seven and a half minutes in. This is its second appearance. So, yeah, it's... um. This is kind of the edge of the observable universe, but the edge of the universe itself. Now, that is an, a very cool question to think about, because I know you didn't even ask this. So it just, was just mentioned that I'm going down this tangent. I think it's really cool to think about what an edge of the universe would be, because we have no concept of edge of the universe, because universe cannot have edge, because that would imply that there's something outside of the universe. It could mean there's something outside of existence, which doesn't make sense. So based on our understanding of the universe, put it that side actually, based on our understanding of the universe, the universe has no edge, which is pretty cool. The universe is everything in existence, therefore there are no edges, no boundaries. But yeah, so the, the comment there that there was some BBC program talking about kids building telescopes, great idea. I fully endorse building telescopes in a like as a kid activity, let's not go into how ethical big telescopes are, but like, Building kids as a fam build building telescopes as a fun kid activity, not building kids as a fun family activity, although also building telescopes is a fun family friendly activity that I very much encourage people to do. Using that to look at the edge of the universe is questionable because the whole concept of the edge of the universe doesn't make much sense. But I like that there are kids programs on the BBC or wherever that are asking these questions or were asking these questions in the past. Because it's very fun to spark this curiosity in people and, you know, start asking what is the universe, what is the edge of the universe, what is happening out there. These are the type of questions that will raise a generation of cosmologists and we can never have too many cosmologists. <coughs> what are some theories that explain why gravity is a relatively weak force? Now, I love this question. So there were... Building kids is not a fun family activity. Well, it depends on your definition of family activity. It's a fun activity to do with your potential spouse maybe anyway this conversation is derailing because of me misphrasing yes do not build kids with your family build a telescope with your family that that with your kids that was kind of where i was going with that sentence yes that sentence kind of got away from me there so there are four forces in the universe that we know of the first one is one that we're very used to it's electromagnetism, electricity and magnetism, you know, lights turn on, we can see things, magnet sticks to fridge, magnet attracts other magnet, magnet repels other magnet, depending on how you're pointing them. Electromagnetic force, we're pretty sure we understand this one. Second force is gravity. You know, we're used to gravity. I drop pen, pen falls down. We stay in orbit around the sun. We stay in orbit in our galaxy, black holes smash together. All of these things, gravity or mavity, if you like. Um, this is another force that we're pretty used to. Then there's the other two forces, the strong nuclear force and the weaker nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is responsible for holding things together. For an example, holding the quarks together inside nucleus and then holding photons, sorry, inside photons and neutrons and then holding photons and neutrons together inside nucleus. This is the strong force. And then there's a weak force that is responsible for radioactive decay and a lot of other core phenomena in the universe. So out of these, you know, we have electromagnetic, gravity, strong, weak. And based on the descriptions I gave, I'll ask you which one don't we understand. And if you think the weak force, you'd be correct, because that's the one that I just mumbled, radioactive decay, let's move on. Actually, the force we don't understand there is gravity. We have a pretty good understanding of the other three. We know how they behave. We know that there are particles responsible for carrying the forces. The electromagnetic force is kind of carried by photons, particles of light. The strong nuclear force is carried by gluons. They glue things together, so we call them the gluon particle. And the weak force is carried by W and Z bosons, and you have W plus, W minus, and Z. You have three bosons, so the weak force needed three. Which then asks the question of how does gravity, what carries gravity, we don't know. Because in order to answer that question, we would need a theory of quantum gravity, which would unite the gravitational world, big things with the quantum world, tiny things. We don't know how to do this. 
Hypothetically, you could have a particle that would be called the graviton, which would carry the gravitational force. But we have not been able to find any such particle. And based on what, we, <coughs> what we've been able to see, um, gravitons haven't been discovered yet because we're not entirely sure how or what these gravitons would do or how to actually measure them in a meaningful way because to do to understand this a graviton would be the cornerstone of a quantum gravity theory and we don't have one yet based on observations of gravitational waves we know that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light which means anything any particle that would carry them would have to be massless like the photon is massless so the graviton would be massless. We know it would be a spin two particle based on some symmetries that we can pull out in the standard model of particle physics. But otherwise, yeah, it's quite hard to, to find gravitons. It's quite hard to build the model because in order to unite the quantum world with the gravitational world, we need quantum gravity. And we're not, there yet. we're not yet there. We're not yet there. We're not there yet. That's what I was going for. We're not there yet. But the question was not about gravitons. So I mentioned these four forces. We literally have one called the weak force. We have one called the strong force. We have electromagnetic. And then we have gravity. And out of these four, if I ask you which is the weakest, you'd be very reasonable to say the weak force. It sounds like the weak one. And you'd be wrong because physicists are terrible at naming things. The weak force is one of the three strong rough forces. A strong force is also a strong force. And electromagnetic is a strong force. Gravity is ridiculously weak. Gravity is orders of magnitude weaker than all the other forces. No, you haven't seen the CMB mug for in a while. So CMB mug is back today, mainly because my favorite mugs are dirty. But now I've got my CMB mug. So the thing we know about gravity is that gravity is a curvature of space time. This is what we know from general relativity. Objects with mass tell space time how to bend and the curvature of space time tells objects how to move. When you phrase it like this, you don't really need a particle to carry this because it's more about space time itself than the particles traveling in space time. But then this makes gravity very different to the other forces. And we're not really sure why gravity should be different to the other four forces. Is it actually a completely different type of force? And then we come to the fact that gravity is orders of magnitude weaker than any other force. And you can. You can see this very, very easily. For an example, just drop a paperclip, then you can use a fridge magnet, a tiny little fridge magnet to pick up the paperclip. That means you are using this tiny, tiny little magnet to beat the gravitational pull of the entire planet. You know, that paperclip is being held down by the gravitational pull of the Earth. And yet you can use a tiny little magnet to pick it up. We can also see this with things like magnetic levitation, where you can use electric fields and magnets to actually make things levitate. We've done this with trains. We have levit levitating trains or trains that kind of glide based on this magnet magnetic effect. We discussed this a lot when I was talking about superconductors uh, over the summer when there was a lot of hype about superconductors. So there are a lot of things that we've already been able to see that can um, actually defeat gravity. So gravity is the weakest force, and gravity decreases like the distance squared. So the further away the, from an object you are, the less strong the gravitational force is, or the weaker it is. So then this is a big question. Why is gravity weaker than all the other forces? And why is gravity not carried by a particle? Or is it carried by a particle like the other forces? And how do you fit gravity together in our standard model of particle physics? And we don't have the answer to any of those questions. Because answering those questions would mean, again, having a theory of quantum gravity, which we don't have. We have not been able to find a, a cohesive theory that can tie these two together. And the reason is, is the length scales involved. So what I mean by the length scales is the distance on which they act. Because if you think about the other forces that I mentioned, the strong, the weak, these are ones that happen on the scale of, of you know, particles, the, the distance between particles. These are very, very, very small distances. I was going to bring up the standard model of particle physics, but it's like my image number 35 out of 40, so it's going to take me a while. If you see me looking, glancing in that direction, it's because I'm looking at my little images waiting for my standard model of particle physics to come up at some point. Yeah, so ah, there we go. Standard model, model of particle physics here. You have it. So this is our standard model of particle physics. You can see these are the 17 building blocks of nature that we know of that constitute 
all of the standard matter. We have the quarks, up, down, strains, charm, top, bottom. These cannot exist alone. They have to be found always together. You never find an up. You find an up and two downs, or two ups and a down. Then you have protons and neutrons. Then we have the leptons. The leptons can be found alone. You have three families of leptons, electron, muon, tau, and their corresponding neutrinos. And then we have the bosons, gluon, photon, Z boson, W bosons. These res are responsible respectively for strong force, electromagnetic force, and Z and W take the weak force. And then we have the Higgs boson over here on the right, up, kind of up here above me, up here. Um, this is the one responsible for giving everything else mass. We have a very nice theory that explains all of this. This is called our standard model of particle physics. It doesn't have many free parameters, just the masses and the couplings, like how strongly coupled these things are, how strong they interact with each other and with other particles. But we have no idea how to put gravity into this. We don't know how gravity appears in the standard model or how to, how to explain gravity within this framework, how to fit it in. And it goes back to what I was just saying about the length scales. When we think about the strong force and the weak force, these act on distances of atomic distances or the distance between particles. When we think about gravity, we can talk about the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way holding everything, all of the galaxy in orbit. The length scales are vastly different. We're talking about something 10 to the 15 meters, 10 to the 9 meters versus 10 to the 20 meters. You know, we're talking orders and orders of magnitude difference here, which is why it's very, very different to, to put this together. And I see someone here at Pratt saying, that it's not 17 building blocks, it's 33 building blocks if you include supersymmetry. Now, supersymmetry is an attempt to explain a lot of things in the standard model. It can also attempt to explain the origin of particles. And depending who you believe, supersymmetry will also maybe help explain gravity. However, we have not yet found any evidence for supersymmetry. And in fact, all of the predictions that supersymmetry model, the minimal symmetric super the minimal symmetric, supersymmetric model, all of these predictions have not yet been found, which is why a lot of people say that Susie is um, dead. Susie, Susie supersymmetry is no longer easy to find given existing constraints. Of course, you can always change your model, you can change some parameters. There's a lot of people still working on Susie, and I think that's really, really cool. But there was kind of the expectation that the Large Hadron Collider, the Particle Collider in Switzerland, was going to find hints of supersymmetry, and it hasn't which means supersymmetry is, is becoming less popular, but there are still many people working on it, and there are still ways where you can kind of use supersymmetry to explain things. You just now have a lot of observational constraints. So, you know, I'm not going to say supersymmetry is dead. There are some people that are still working on this, but it is something that is no longer as likely as it was 10, 15 years ago, which is why I don't by default assume that supersymmetry is, is correct. And there was a question before of what would I name the strong and weak forces instead of strong and weak. So I would name, I think electromagnetism is fine, gravity is fine. The strong one I would probably call the gluing force or the binding force, something like that. And the weak one, I think the decay force would make sense. So I think there are other names that are not just strong and weak because strong and weak is misleading when weak is stronger than gravity. But, you know, physicists are bad at naming things. We're not going to change the name of the forces. It's fine. They're the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, known as strong force and weak force for short. Which force is overcome in a nuclear chain reaction? So a nuclear chain reaction depends what type of reaction you're talking about. Um, in the fission reaction, which would be the, the cool one. So fission is where you take something and you rip it apart. Uh, fission is what gives us a lot of energy. And there you're pulling things apart, so you're defeating the strong force. And in fusion reactions, you're throwing stuff together, kind of what happens in the center of the sun. So there you're, you're just throwing a lot of stuff together, and, and this binds and produces chain reactions like that. So there's these two different ones. But the fission one, which is kind of the chain reaction that we think of, is when you split something apart. That happens when you overcome the, the nuclear force that is binding things together, so the strong nuclear force. OK, and I see there were a few comments that I missed that I want to go back to. What about antiparticles? So antiparticles are particles that have opposite quantum numbers. So if you have an electron that has spin up, you can have an anti-electron that has, let's do it this way, you have an electron that has spin up, you have an anti-electron that has spin down. When these come together, they are going to annihilate and produce radiation. So antimatter is something that we know exists. 
pretty much every particle can have an antiparticle. There are some exceptions. For an example, photon doesn't have an antiphoton because its quantum numbers are basically zero, so then it's quite hard to mirror it. Electrons have anti-electrons, up quarks have anti-quarks, anti-up quarks. These are not kind of put in the standard model because they are just the, the mirror image kind of of the standard model and they're ones that we know how to how to explain, how to play about with. So antimatter is something that is pretty well understood. We know we know as of recently we've been able to prove that antimatter follows gravity in the same way that normal matter does. So antiparticles are a part of the standard model, so to speak. We just don't show them there in, in that picture because they basically be exactly the same, just with opposite quantum numbers. OK, uh, there was a comment here by David Howden. I still find it hard to understand why the forces only work at small distances. Gravity working at infinite distance, but strength decline feels intuitive. Others just stopping feels strange. Yes. <laughs> So the electromagnetic force also works at, at strong distances, at larger distances as well. This is how light can travel throughout the universe in, in a sense, but then it's the photons that are doing the traveling. As for the other one, it is something that I don't have a good explanation right now without going into maths. So there is a way where mathematically you can see why, um, why they just kind of drop off. But I'm trying to think of a way of explaining it that is not just pulling up equations. And right now, I don't have a way of doing that. So I'm going to make a note of why do forces stop. And it takes me a bit longer to make notes because writing is, is still difficult. Uh, why do forces just stop? I will try to answer that next week because that is a very, very cool question. And it's one that I can answer mathematically, but it might not, probably wouldn't help. So I want to give her a proper answer. So I'll come back to you about that. OK, uh, so what about antiparticles we covered? I thought electrons and positrons only differed in charge, not spin. You know, I always mix up charge and spin. Uh, and I always say up and down. And yes, it's um, if you have an anti, an electron is negative, a positron is positively charged. So they have opposite charge. Do they also have opposite spin? I would have to I'd have to think about that. So, um, yeah. I'm just I'm just asking Google spin a postage on. Yeah, so the spin is the same, sorry, that is correct. It's the, the charge that is opposite. I always say spin and charge, and I mix these two up consistently. I think I did a whole stream once where I throughout the entire stream I said spin when I meant to say charge, and I only realized it like three minutes after finishing the stream. And there's actually a comment on one of my YouTube videos saying it, just replace the word spin everywhere with the word charge. So yes, uh, electrons and positrons have the same spin. So you have one that is positively charged and one that is negatively charged. They come together and they annihilate. Everything else is the same. They come together, they annihilate. So antiparticles have opposite charge to normal particles. OK, uh, let's see. They don't answer those. Uh, DS9 reference, I have actually not seen DS9. I know people keep telling me to watch DS9, Deep Space Nine. I have not actually seen it, and I kind of should. You know, I have not watched enough Star Trek, given that I am named after Star Trek characters, so I really should watch more Star Trek. Okay, there was another question just now, uh, two other questions. Uh, I saw, where was the JWST one? I saw um, something about JWST and now I've lost it. Okay, wasn't a new black hole recently discovered by JWST that's the furthest away? Maybe. So the JWST, the Just Wonderful Space Telescope, keeps finding cool things. And it keeps finding things that are further away than we expected, which is very cool. Uh, people are still trying to figure out what it's finding or why it's finding things that appear to be further away. I didn't actually read about JWST finding a new black hole, but it would not surprise me because it keeps finding things and it's very cool. So is there a particle that has the same charge as an electron but opposite spin? Um, maybe? I feel like the answer to that is probably yes, but then it's a particle that I should know, but it's not in my mind right now. You know, you know, if you pull up a standard model of particle physics, which I'm not going to do again, because I've gone back to the beginning of my slide deck, and this one was at the end. Actually, let, let's go back to it. Let, let's go back to my standard model of particle physics. Because if you look at the standard model of particle physics, the graph that I was showing before, there is always a spin and the charge of everything listed. So then from there, you can find what has opposite spin to what, what has opposite charge to what. So when my uh, slides catch up, I'm going to show the standard model again. 
So um, Golo Golov coming in late here, just to mention the minor medical emergency last week. I know you saw my comment about it. Uh, nothing major. I slipped on the ice. I busted up my right arm. Nothing broken. I just have a sprained elbow and um, can't use my wrist properly. It will heal in one or two weeks. Oh, it, I had to cancel last week's stream because I was at the emergency room, but nothing major. Uh, so nothing to be concerned about. Just if you wonder why I'm only using one hand today, it's because this one is still a bit, a bit painful to use. On the plus side, I've learned how to do things like eat and brush my teeth left-handed because my right hand is my dominant one, and when you can't use that, that, that is a problem. I'm, I'm still going through the slide deck looking for the standard model. And just taking the chance to once again show off this awesome, awesome mug that I have, which was the old Cup of Cosmology webpage. Awesome mug that I have here. Okay, so I'm not sure how well you can see this with the resolution of your screen, but there, there are three numbers in the top left corner of every box. The top one is the mass, the second one is the charge, the bottom one is the spin. So you can see that all of the quarks have spin one half, they have a, a non-full spin, and when you put them all together, then you get different types of spin. Electrons, muons, taus also have spin one half, electrons, uh, sorry, neutrinos also have spin one half, all of the bosons have spin one. And then the charge, we have things like two thirds for or the charms, minus one third for downstream and bottom, minus one for the for the first generator for the electron moving on tau and zero for the neutrinos then for the bosons you have spin zero in all of them sorry charge zero in all of them except the w ones which are plus and minus looks clear on the ipad mini great so um yeah here you can see the numbers and you can see there is nothing listed here with spin minus one half there are things here that have positive spin one half so you ask is there any particle that has the opposite spin of an electron so you'd want something that has charge minus one and spin minus one half and nothing comes to mind that fits that definition right now that doesn't mean there's not one like that it just means that it's not coming to my mind right now but yes that is particle physics which i should know the answer to but today my particle physics is apparently not in my mind because i'm missing all of the particle physics questions but that's okay that's it. This is why I usually talk about cosmology instead of particle physics. I, I technically know my particle physics, but sometimes my brain is like, yeah, I studied that at some point. It comes, it comes and goes. Currently, my mind is full of cosmology and quantum physics because I'm the teaching assistant on the quant introduction to quantum physics lectures, and it is so much fun. We get, we get to tell the students about particles behaving as in a quantum way you know they're there and then they're not there they're waves and they're particles they do fun things they change their behavior based on whether they're being observed or not it's great it's the first time the students encounter quantum physics and it's really fun because there's a general sense of bafflement and you get to tell them like yeah it's confusing it's quantum physics but hey yeah, experiments show us that it works so this is how it is it, it's really fun uh so yeah my brain currently is full of cosmology and a lot of quantum physics which is really fun and grant writing which is less fun okay there was a non-particle phase oh there was a question just now which i really like just now being 15 minutes ago so there was a question of any major cosmological fact or theory disproved in the last 10 years and this is a very cool question so science is, as usual, a very slow and gradual pro process, and it takes a while for results to happen, and things happen very slowly. So it's not like you wake up one day and all of cosmology has been changed. It's a slow and gradual process. That said, anytime we have new experiments, they provide results. There's a lot of theories that make a lot of different predictions. Now, the idea is that you have a model, you make predictions, you do observations, and then you see if your observations match your predictions or not. And the observations are the most important point here. Your theory can be as beautiful and elegant as you like, but if it doesn't match the observations, it is wrong. So anytime we get more observations, there are models that are going to be disproven. Now, a couple of examples of this. Within the last 10 years, I was just thinking it's 2023. So the first full data release we got from the Planck satellite, which was measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation, was in 2023. Sorry, in 2013. So that counts within the 10 year time frame. This image that you see here is from Planck 2018. So this is the most up to date image we have of the CMB. But before this, there was a release in 2013 and 2015. And these were kind of the first really pushing to the percent level precision images of the CMB. So the reason this is important is because the CMB showed us that so that up to very, very high precision, 
our standard vanilla cosmological model where we have six parameters, three for so amount of dark energy, amount of normal matter, amount of dark matter, age of the universe, time at which stars turned on, uh, sorry, not age of the universe. Let's, let's do that again. You have amount of matter, amount of dark matter, amount of dark energy, time at which stars began to turn on, and then you have two that set how, how bumpy the universe was before the CMB. Um, these six parameters are enough to explain the CMB and a lot of observations. Now, there were a lot of extensions to Lambda CDM, or the Lambda CDM being this model of six parameters. There were a lot of theories beyond this that once we got th this level of precision with the CMB, we could say, actually, these six parameters seem to be enough. You know, models in which you have five extra parameters didn't perform as well as these. So those are a lot of theories or models or facts that were then not really proven wrong, but less compatible with the data. So a lot of non-Lambda CDM models became less favored once we got the CMB picture. Then you could look at this from a different perspective. So I just want to see exactly the phrasing of the question. Where was the question? Lost it. There was a question. Any major cosmological factor theory disproved? Yeah. So there were a lot of these things that became less likely once we got these CMB images. Of course, now you can argue the other point of view that in the last five or six years, there have been a couple of tensions that have appeared. So by tensions, what I mean is that different, different experiments, different ways of measuring different numbers don't completely agree. And an example of this is how, if we ask the question of how fast is the universe expanding, there are several different ways you can ask the universe this question. One of them is by looking at the CMB, then saying, okay, from CMB, I know that Lambda CDM appears to be the correct cosmological model. So you use the CMB together with Lambda CDM, you project this for 13 and a half billion years to see how fast the universe would be expanding today based on the CMB and what we've assumed we know of cosmology from the CMB. And if you do get that, you get a, the answer to your question of the universe is expanding at 67 point something kilometers per second per megaparsec. There's just, there's just some random units that we use. Another thing you can do to ask how fast is the universe expanding is look at how stars are moving away from us in close by galaxies. This is done using standard candles, so stars for which we know the, the expected brightness, and based on the distance, which we can calculate in several different ways, you can calculate kind of how fast things are moving away from us, and therefore how quickly the universe is expanding. And if you do this, you get an answer of around 73. So between 67 and 73, there is not a big difference. You know, it's very, very cool that they're that close together, and we didn't get 600 from one and two from the other, or something like that. But 67 and 73 are not close enough. And I'm just going to drink tea now. Over the last few years, we've pushed our, our uncertainty on these measurements to a really, really low amount, which means it's not just 67, it's 67 plus minus 0 0.5, which tells us it's somewhere between 66 and a half and 75 and a half. And if you do it with standard candles, you find a value of 73 plus minus 1. So it's somewhere between 72 and 74. These mean that statistically, these are more than five signal apart, which is a problem. You know, and you, you ask the question, has, has anything been proven wrong? And I wouldn't say that this has proven our standard cosmological model wrong. But it does mean there is something that our standard cosmological model cannot explain. And there's a couple of tensions like this. And it really just seems that our standard cosmological model is failing at explaining these observations. Has it been proven wrong? Absolutely not, because we haven't found a better solution. We haven't found something that works better. But within the last 10 years, a lot of questions have come up about how, how much can we trust our standard cosmological model to do this type of measurement, because it seems like if we do it in a different way, we get a different number. But we haven't found something that does a better job. So there's that. But something that I think is an excellent answer to the question you asked, has anything been proven wrong in the last 10 years? So gravitational waves are an amazing thing. Gravitational waves are this idea that you can have ripples in the fabric of space-time itself, like waves in the ocean, you can have this in space-time. Anything that is accelerating through space-time can produce these ripples. Like if you have black holes spiraling around each other and then smashing together, 
if you have supernova, if you have a small black hole falling into a big black hole, or even the universe itself when it expanded in its infancy, all of this can produce ripples in the fabric of space-time. And this is something we have been able to measure here on Earth, which is absolutely mind-blowing and amazing. You know, if two black holes smash together a couple billion light years away, they produce gravitational waves, they produce the equivalent of three solar masses of energy. Like you burn up three suns, turn all of that into gravitational waves. That's how much energy you release when two black holes smash together. But by the time these gravitational waves reach you, they're so small that their effect is, you know, if a gravitational wave hits me straight on, it would make me get thinner and taller and then shorter and fatter. But the difference would be one billionth of the width of a human hair. It is small, it is tiny, it is insignificant. And yet we have been able to measure these gravitational waves using lasers, which sounds like science fiction, but it's actually true, which is amazing. And I'll never get over saying how amazing that fact is. So why does this matter? Why is this relevant? Apart from that, it's cool and that I work on this. So when two neutron stars smash together, you get gravitational waves. Neutron stars are the most dense stars you can imagine. It's where stars are so, so, so dense that if you consider your usual picture of an atom, you have a proton, you have a, or protons and neutrons, and you have electrons going around. It's not a perfect picture, but it's a good way to think of atoms. Inside a neutron star, the energy is so high, the density is so high, that the protons and the electrons can actually combine together to form neutrons. So it's like a crushing pressure. And these stars do emit some type of light. They're neutron stars. They're not completely dark. So when two neutron stars collide, not only do they produce gravitational waves, they also produce electromagnetic waves, which means they produce a burst of energy that you can see in gamma rays and X-rays and radio waves. So smashing neutron stars together is a perfect way for us to measure simultaneously the gravitational waves and the electromagnetic waves and put these together to see what happens. And we got such an event in 2017, LIGO, Virgo, Kagwa, at the time just LIGO and Virgo were doing measurements. These are gravitational wave observations we have here on Earth. And they saw these colliding neutron stars. The Fermi lads, Fermi is a satellite that is in space and it's looking for gamma rays. So this was the first one to see it. It saw a burst of energy and it sent an alert to all other space, spacecrafts, look up there. And all the thousands of astronomers pointed their space, the telescopes or the spacecrafts up there. And we got to see these merging neutron stars across a whole electromagnetic range over, over a few days. And then LIGO and Virgo would check their data and like, hey, we saw it too in gravitational waves. Why did this matter? Because it allowed us to see that the gravitational waves and the electromagnetic waves arrived almost at the same time. A second difference, a two seconds difference over such a long distance. What this tells us is that gravity, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. And this is really, really cool because this is a prediction of Einstein's general relativity, the, the most common theory that we have to explain gravity on cosmic scales, on sc universal scales. But not everyone thinks that general relativity is the correct model. There's a lot of ways you can change general relativity. For an example, you could change general relativity to try to explain the effects of dark energy or dark matter. <coughs> But a lot of these models beyond general relativity predicted that gravitational waves would travel faster than the speed or slower than the speed of light or at a different speed that was not the speed of light. So this is cool because this measurement showed us that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, which immediately meant a lot of non, <coughs> sorry, a lot of modified gravity scenarios became incompatible with the data. That one observation, <coughs> that one observation was like, okay, this is a prediction in general relativity. In other models, this is not a prediction, they predict something else. So that measurement allowed us to rule out a lot of models. It still doesn't mean general relativity is correct. It just means it is still the best one we've been able to find to fit the data. So the question which I've given a very long answer to was what models or facts have been ruled out in cosmology in the last 10 years? And I would argue that it's a very long list because anytime there is a new observation, you rule out some model or you rule out some theory or some idea. With, we have examples when Planck found that Lambda CDM was the best fitting model, then not some non-Lambda CDM models became harder to, to make compatible with the data. When we measure gravitational waves traveling at the speed of light, some non-gravity, some non 
general relativity models became less less compatible with the data again i'm not saying ruled out just harder for these models to to explain the observations and you can also do things like you know anytime we we run the large hadron collider and we don't find dark matter or we find we look at collider experiments or direct detection dark matter experiments and we don't find dark matter it doesn't rule stuff out it just makes it harder for certain models to be compatible with the data so there's often the idea that we expect observations to to be what rules stuff out but sometimes the lack of an observation the lack of observing a prediction is equally important if a model predicts something and then you look for it and don't find it exactly where you expect to find it then perhaps your model is wrong so it's um there is a lot of this process where you come up with 100 models and then every time you get data you narrow it down more and more and more until you're left with one that you say okay this is the most likely one it doesn't mean it's perfect it just means it's the most likely one given all the data that i have one nice thing about this mug this color this is obviously a custom made mug as you can see, it's got the CMB. It's got my old catchphrase on, which I don't use anymore because I've outgrown that, which was um, because science. I don't use that catchphrase anymore. I, I don't like it. it it's obsolete. Uh, and it has uh, the old web page of Cup of Cosmology. But the good thing is it's half a litre, which is why it's taking me a lot bit longer than usual to drink my tea. It's because it's half a litre of tea here. I made the mistake once of filling this to the brim with coffee. It was a terrible idea. Half a litre of coffee in the span of 10 minutes was absolutely a terrible decision. But currently I'm drinking caffeine free tea, so that's okay. It's um, it's just chamomile and rooibos and sleep. It's actually called sleepy tea. It does not make me sleep, but it's called sleepy tea. Are gravitational wave paths distorted by mass in the way light waves are? Do they get lens? Yes, they do. And that is a great question. I love that question. So gravitational waves can exist can experience lensing. So lensing is what happens when light travels around a massive object. This massive object is curving space time. So as the light beam travels close to this object, it will its path will be curved due to the curvature of space time. So you have this big massive, for an example, clump of dark matter, then light coming around is going to feel the curvature of space time. This is like curving space time. It's going to feel this and be deflected around it. Size matters with T-mugs, it does. You know, bigger T-mugs are always a good decision unless you fill it with coffee, then it's a terrible decision. So as gravitational waves are traveling through the universe, is there, a, there is some, sorry, as gravitational waves are traveling through the universe, if there is a big massive object, they can actually be distorted. They can have this kind of lensing. And this is really cool because if you would think about how small of an effect lensing is for light, and then apply that to gravitational waves that are already really small, we're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny correction on top of a tiny, tiny, tiny phenomenon. And yet this is something that people think we might be able to measure in the future. So I know like two or three years ago, people asked me, do gravitational waves get lens? And I was like, I don't think so. But they do. They actually do. And it's something that I've heard more and more people talking about over the last couple of years. Of course, now I work on it. So I hear more about gravitational waves. There's kind of confirmation bias here. But there are more people working on gravitational wave lensing these days because it can help us distinguish what is creating the gravitational wave, where it's coming from, how far it's traveled. So this whole concept of lensing of gravitational waves is really, really cool. It's a small effect on top of a small effect, but it's something that there is hope that in the future, LIGO, Virgo, CAGO, if these keep performing as expected or better, which is what they were expecting in the future, you know, we're expecting CAGO to do better. We're expecting LIGO to do better. Maybe, maybe someday they could actually try to measure the lensing of the gravitational waves. That would be amazing. So gravitational waves are affected by gravity itself. They are. They are traveling in space time and therefore they feel the curvature of space time. So if space time is really curved by a massive object. Gravitational waves are going to feel this as well because they are vibrations in vibrations of space time so it's all if all of space time is curved they are going to curve with this which is very very cool to think about so yeah gravitational waves are also affected by gravity itself which is very cool to think about and then you can also have interference where gravitational waves crash together and interfere with each other very 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 fun stuff like that okay so we're at 55 minutes we've almost reached the one hour mark of the stream and there's something that i feel like i have to discuss very briefly 
because my last stream was the 5th of November or around then, like early November. And it was two days before we were set to get the first Euclid images. And I did say when I'm back next week on the 12th of November, we'll talk about the new Euclid images. And then, of course, I, I didn't do the stream for three weeks in a row. And this is actually my first stream since the Euclid images were released. So we have to talk about it. I feel like I owe it to you all to talk about the Euclid images, at least briefly. I know it's old news by now, but it's still amazing. So Euclid is a satellite that we've launched that mission is to study dark matter and dark energy. Euclid is going to map galaxies out to really far away, like looking 10 billion years into the past, and is going to create a detailed 3D map of galaxies and how these have evolved over time. The reason this is important is because mapping galaxies allows us to get an idea of how dark matter is behaving and mapping galaxies across different epochs in, the, in different times in the history of the universe shows us how matter has behaved at different times, which shows us how dark energy is pulling things around. So, yeah, we um, Euclid is very, very cool. Euclid is a mission that when I started my PhD was like a faraway dream. And then Euclid launched this July, July's first the very first launch window it launched and um, it went better than we possibly could have hoped for there were some small hiccups with some alignment mirrors that were misaligned this was fixed euclid is now orbiting in the lagrange point two which is a point where you can just dump spacecrafts and they stay in stable orbit it's pretty nice euclid is now in lagrange two euclid has started taking the the kind of like test data to prove that it can work to prove what it's going to do and in early November, Euclid released its first set of images. And these were images that I made the comment the week before they came out, like, don't expect spectacular views because that's not Euclid's job. You know, it's not the next JWST. It's not the next Hubble Space Telescope. It's doing something completely different. It's mapping galaxies. So I thought the images would be kind of, the point of these images was to get people excited about Euclid and to kind of prove that Euclid was on the right path and we knew what Euclid was doing. But I said to you all, you know, don't expect the most spectacular images you've ever seen. So when the Euclid images came out, I was so pleasantly surprised by how incredibly detailed they were. I was not expecting the Euclid images to look as amazing as they did. So I'm gonna do a screen share. I'm gonna share a specific tab, this one here. Here we go, let's see da, da, da. If, if it works, when, when it loads. Yes, Chrome tab, this one. Can we share this one? Why can I not share this one? It's giving me the option to share and then it's saying, actually, no, you can't share it. Okay, so we're just gonna do it like this. You're gonna to get to see, da, da, da. okay. Give me one sec to do a proper a proper thing. Let me just do it like that. There we go. Okay, just so um, to get rid of some things that you don't necessarily need to see. And of course, now it's not going to let me share it. Okay, I'm just trying to get the Euclid page in a way where I can actually share it and it is being slightly disagreeable. So let's just try this one more time. Uh, da -da, let's turn that off. Okay, there we go. Because I don't want to share like my full bookmarks and history and everything. Okay, let's try this one more time. Where's my Where's my Chrome window? Here we go. You should now be very soon getting the images up on screen. Let's add it to the stream. Okay, so we have the different Euclid images. Um, this is from the Euclid webpage. You can see the URL at the top of the page. This is the Perseus cluster. This is one of the five images. This one was a very cool image, but not the coolest. We had this one here released as well. Why did it do that? Come on. Okay, and it's being slightly, slightly disagreeable. I want to go to the fifth image. Here we go. This was one of the coolest images to come out of the Euclid first image release. This is the Horsehead Nebula. This is one we've all seen hundreds of times. We've seen many different versions of this. I was not expecting this level of detail from Euclid. This is an incredibly pretty image. You know, when, when they said the first, ion, the first image release, I knew they were going to be images designed to get people interested in the mission. I was not expecting them to be this pretty. This image is amazing. I love this image. So we got five images from Euclid. We got the Horsehead Nebula, which is the one you can see here. We got this one here, which is the Perseus cluster. This one is also really, really nice. You can see a bunch of galaxies here. You can see some lensing. We also then got this one here, which is the spiral galaxy. 
very, very detailed image. We got this one here, which is an irregular galaxy. And, you know, these four are amazing. They're really, really pretty images. They show a lot of detail. They're really like Euclid is working. This mission is doing its job. But then there's a fifth image, which I've left to last because in my mind, it is the best image. It is absolutely the best image. Uh, so, some things you don't need to see is go through Diana's collection of inappropriate images. Not on my, not on my um, bookmarks. It's just things yeah, that, you know, are private. So... Uh. Have you talked about muonium on stream? I feel like I've mentioned it before, but I'm not sure. Muonium. Uh, not recently. Uh, muonium sounds like something out of sci-fi, but I'm guessing it's a material made of muons. Muonium. I'm write, writing that down. Maybe I'll check it out for next stream. Maybe not, because I often write things down and then completely forget that I've written things down. But I've made a note of it. I don't think I've talked about muonium in the past, but I can talk about it soon. Okay. On to my favorite image from Euclid. And it is this one here. This is a globular cluster. Actually, no, sorry, they're in the wrong order. So the globular cluster is amazing. And I actually showed it to you first. This one here, the Perseus cluster. This one here is my favorite image of Euclid. And the reason is that this image, you can see the bright dots in the bottom left that are stars. Pretty much everything else in this image is a galaxy. You can see a cluster to the right. You can see hundreds of galaxies in this image. Now, the reason this one is my favorite is because this is exactly what Euclid is going to be measuring. Right? The Horsehead Nebula is pretty. The galaxies are pretty. The globular cluster is pretty. But this here, this is a proof that Euclid can find hundreds of galaxies. And this was just one tiny part of the sky. So like, look over there and point here. And there are hundreds of galaxies in this image. Euclid is going to do this across all the, across a huge fraction of the sky. And to me, this image really shows what Euclid is going to deliver to us. You know, the other images are pretty, but this here, the fact that Euclid can see so many galaxies. Now imagine that Euclid can measure the distance to all of these galaxies and build a detailed map of where these all are in 3D. Not just here's like some galaxies, but here's where they are in 3D, like a 3D map of the universe. That is what Euclid is going to give us. So I was hyped about the Euclid image release. I was hyped about the Euclid launch. This image here made me so excited for the Euclid results because this is exactly what we all hoped for. This here is Euclid is going to do its job. Euclid is in business. Euclid is going to work. I love this image. I wanted to talk to you about this image the day after it came out and then stuff happened. My I canceled my stream. But I had to mention this because this is amazing. You know, the fact that we've built this telescope, sent it to space, it's absolutely brilliant. I cannot wait to see what Euclid is going to give us. We will get the first like actual science data release from Euclid early next year. There's going to be the, the like pre-science release, which is just the first tests showing that everything is working. And then the, the actual data release will be in 2026. But next year, we should already get some preliminary ideas of what Euclid is doing. I love it. I love that that this is what Euclid is, is showing us. The images that came out are amazing. I cannot wait to see what Euclid tells us about, about the universe. And, you know, I'm not involved in the Euclid mission. I would like to be. I, I've written a paper on Euclid stuff. I would like to be to do more Euclid stuff, actually. But Euclid is so cool. And these images are just, just absolutely amazing. So uh, muonium is an atom with a positron orbiting a muon that should chemically be similar to anti-hydrogen, but much lighter, yeah. Uh, that sounds reasonable. It's not something I've spoken about on the stream. I can look into it and see why it's interesting and why, why it's worth talking about. I made a note of it. But as David Howden says, I should write down a note to remind me that I've written something down. The problem is I have this, um, this notepad here and pen that is used specifically for this stream or when I'm in a phone call and need to jot something down. Like if you go one page previous, there's a name of a hospital, which I jotted down last week when I figured out which hospital to go to for my arm injury which means I only take this out 10 minutes before the stream every Sunday, or if I there's like some emergency during the week. So most of the time I write stuff down. You see, there's two things here. Why do forces stop at a specific distance and muonium? And I'll put this in the cupboard after the stream and it was gonna stay there until next Sunday. So then depending on what time I get it out next Sunday determines whether I have time to look into it before the next stream or not. Because if I take it out an hour before that, I'll be like, hey, I have an hour, let me look into muonium. 
if I take it out five minutes before the stream, which is what usually happens, I'm like, oh, there's a list of things I should look up. I'll just add to it today. So that's why um, I don't always look up things when I promise to look them up. It's because they're on the list. But then between being on the list and actually looking them up are two separate things. That said, if you want to guarantee that I talk about something, there is a way you can do this. There is actually a link on the Cup of Cosmology webpage, cupofcosmology.com. There's a section called Get Involved. And there's three ways you can get involved. And one of them is to request a topic. And by requesting the topic, you can ask me for a topic that I will talk about for the whole stream. And in exchange, I ask that you do a donation to one of the um, foundations that improve um, improve access to science around the world. There's a list on my web pages, instructions. But if at any point you want to request a one hour long topic, get in touch with me, make sure I'm OK with the topic, and then follow the instructions on the web page. So you go to cupofcosmology.com, get involved. And there you can literally request a one hour long stream about the topic. And if you do the donation that I request you to do, it's a symbolic amount. But if you do that, then you can request a topic. You can also volunteer to be a guest. You can nominate other people to be a guest. And as always, you can support a cup of cosmology on Kofi. There's a link in the YouTube description down below. It's kofi.com slash DC Hooper 91. Um, you know, just to anyone who does that, I, I'm deeply appreciative to the people who do send me coffees on, on Kofi. And any money that you send me there goes to maintaining the cost of a cup of cosmology, the web page, and the streams. So you know, you, there are ways you can get involved and there are ways you can request a topic. If you want a super symmetry topic, I can set that up, follow the instructions for the get involved on the web page. And I could find an expert in the building to do a super symmetry stream together if, if you want to request that. So that is an option. OK, we've now gone over the hour mark because I knew that Euclid would not take 10 minutes. I don't know why I left Euclid till the end, because of course I was going to talk about Euclid for more than 10 minutes. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I know Cup of Cosmology has been a bit absent the last few weeks. So I apologize for that. I do like keeping to a regular schedule, but I always have the idea that life comes first. Uh, there's been just a lot of things happening in my life the last few months. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a year. It's, um, yeah, it's been a year. But uh, I would say Cup of Cosmology is back to a regular schedule, but it's not true. Uh, Cup of Cosmology, I'll be online next Sunday, Sunday 10th of December. And then I'm basically going to be taking a break because I'm traveling and then it's Christmas and then it's New Year's and then I have a grand deadline. So I'll be online next Sunday. I should be online unless I like fall on the ice again. So I should be online next Sunday, same time as today. And then after that, I'm not sure when the next cup of cosmology will be, but it's quite likely that next week will be the last stream of the year. And then I'll be back in January. Life absolutely comes first. Thank you. And people saying, glad I'm not seriously injured. Thank you. Me too. I honestly thought I'd broken my arm when I was in the emergency room. I was laughing at myself of how stupid it was. But fortunately, I didn't. And I'm very happy that I didn't break my arm and end up with a cast because I'm actually going to a wedding in, in two weeks. And I did not want to have a cast at the wedding. And that's tied to me traveling. I'm actually going to India for a wedding, for like one week long wedding. And I'm so excited. So I'll be on the stream next Sunday. And then I'll be traveling and uh, I'm traveling to India. And then I don't know when I'll be on the net on the stream again, but I should be online next Sunday, barring any like falls on ice or family things or personal things happening. I should be online again next week. Let's 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 aim for that. So as always, thank you everyone for joining. This has been really, really fun. Uh, you're welcome to get in touch with me. I don't check Twitter. There, it is highly likely that in the new year, the streams are going to disappear from Twitter as well. I only use the Twitter now for these live streams, but I do not endorse anything that Twitter is doing these days. So it's quite likely that in the new year, these streams will only be available on YouTube. So those of you who still follow me on Twitter, start getting used to the idea that that is not going to be a thing going forward. Like Probably as of January, these streams will only be on YouTube. I might look at bringing back Twitch, but basically, if you don't yet follow me on YouTube, do so. You can also follow me on Mastodon, DCHooper91 underscore Cosmo over on Mastodon. You're welcome to follow me there for all science outreach updates. Um, you can get in touch via Mastodon or via the email address, which is contact at cupofcosmology.com. If you ping me on Twitter, I'm not going to see it anymore. I, I, I don't check messages on Twitter anymore. So those of you who reach out to me on Twitter, I'm not going to see it going forward. And um, it's quite likely that the streams won't be on Twitter as of January. 
Depends on where in India. Mumbai barely gets cold for one week in January. So I will be in the Burdgi, three hours northwest of, northeast of Delhi. I've been told to expect around 10 to 15 degrees around there. So cold by some people's standards, a lot warmer than Finland, where it's currently minus 10 degrees. So it's going to be fun. I, I'm so excited about it. Whether it's cold or not, it doesn't matter. It's going to be fun. So anyway, thank you everyone for joining. This has been super, super fun. I hope to see you all again next Sunday, same time as today. As always, here is a time zone convert on cupofcosmology.com so you can figure out when I'm live in your own time zone. And it takes into account daylight saving times. So you can figure that out on cupofcosmology.com. I hope to see you all again next Sunday. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the questions. See you next Sunday. And until then, I hope you will stay safe and take care of each other.